I was finding London in the September of 1903 a dull place. All of my friends were out of town, shooting in Scotland or on the Riviera, and I was at a loose end, a very loose end indeed. I had been led for a few evenings into the shady haunts of Soho, and had even ventured as far east as the Ratcliffe Highway, where I had sat next to a portly female who at frequent intervals refreshed herself and her infant from a bottle of tepid stout. Therefore, I now confine myself to dining at my club, or rather, I should say, at a club which, since mine was being painted and refreshed during the summer, acted as my host. In truth, it was a sorry place and hardly worth dressing for. I could not know that my boredom and indolence was soon to be replaced by the greatest adventure of my life. More boiled cod, sir? Uh, Hawkins? I think not. Um, Carruthers? Uh, nor for me. Very good. Could you bring us the Havanas and a decanter of brandy in the smoking room? Certainly, sir. I know it's bad form to speak ill of one's hosts, but this is a truly awful club. I'm surprised to find you here, Carruthers. I thought you'd be out of town. Well, didn't much care for the invitations I got, and didn't get the invitations I would have cared for. So, the foreign office gets my undivided attention for a change. <laughs> what on earth do you find to do all day? Oh, right boring pracy from the lesser consulate. Ah, uh, I smoke cigarettes, mainly. <laughs> Shall we go through to the smoking room? So, <clears throat> things were a bit bleak socially. No shooting, no yachting parties. As a matter of fact, something has turned up. Do you remember a chap called Davis when we were up at Oxford? On our staircase. Red Law. Quiet sort. I just remember him. Um, a bit scruffy. Not <laughs> yes. in our set. Missed about with boats a lot, I recall. <laughs> That's the chap. Yeah. I saw a bit of him when I came down, but we drifted apart. Your brandy and cigars, sir. Yeah? Ah, thank you. Cut us a pair of Romeos, if you will. I'll cope with the brandy. Very good, sir. Well, he wrote to me yesterday, mm -hmm. invited me to a cruise in the Baltic. The Baltic? And in September? Can't say I'd be too keen. Anyway, I don't know a soul in the Baltic. <laughs> I thought the Admiralty had friends everywhere. We do draw the line somewhere, you know. And the Baltic's uh, a bit odd. So is Davis's letter. Have a look. Oh, <clears throat> hmm. Can't say the notepaper's too impressive. I think this is some kind of oil. Dear Carruthers, I dare say you'll be surprised at hearing from me, as it's ages since we met. So, I merely write on the off chance to ask if you would care to come out here and join me in a little yachting. And I hope duck shooting. My pals have had to leave me, and I'm badly in want of another, as I don't want to lay up yet for a bit. If you can come, send me a wire to the post office here at Flensburg. Bring your gun and lots of number fours. Or, and would you mind getting mine out of Lancaster's and bringing it? Bring some oilskins, too. Better get the eleven shilling sort of jacket and trousers, not the yachting sort. I know you speak German like a native, and that will be a great help. Forgive this hail of directions, but anyway, I hope you and the F.O. flourish. Goodbye. Yours ever, Arthur H. Davis. P.S. Would you mind bringing a pound of raven mixture, a prismatic compass, and a number three ripping gill stove? Quite a shopping list. Are you going? Oh, I've got some leave due. So I saw my boss this morning. You remember him? Yes. Well, I cleared it with him. It all sounds a bit of a lark, so why not? Why no yachting trousers? And what on earth is a ripping gill stone? Very large and heavy indeed. I got all his stuff at the stores today. There was a queue. But I'm off tomorrow night. More brandy. By 8.30 I had shaken off the dust of London from my feet. And at 10.30, I was, thanks to a prompt railway train, pacing the deck of the flushing steamer, adrift on this fatuous holiday in the far Baltic. An air from the west, cooled by a midday thunderstorm, followed the steamer as she slid through the calm channels of the Thames estuary. 
past the cordon of scintillating lightships that watch over the sea road to the imperial city like a sleeping army and slipped out into the dark spaces of the North Sea. An irresistible sense of peace and detachment, combined with that delicious physical awakening that pulses through the nerve-sick townsman when city airs and bad routine are left behind him, combined to provide me with a solid background of resignation. If the weather held up, I might pass a not intolerable fortnight with Davis. I settled this program and then turned in. From Flushing eastward to Hamburg, and then northward to Flensburg. I shall cut short the next day's sultry story, past dike and windmill and still canals, onto blazing stubbles and roaring towns, at the last, after dusk, through a quiet level region where the train pottered from one lazy little station to another. And at ten o'clock, I found myself, stiff and stuffy, on the platform at Flensburg, exchanging greetings with Davis. Davis! I say, Davis! Carabas, my, my dear chap! It's awfully good of you to come! Not at all. It was very good of you to ask me. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm not fit to be seen, but, uh, well, this time of night doesn't matter. I've been painting hard all day. Just got it finished. I say, you've got a good deal of stuff. You gave me a good many commissions. Oh, I didn't mean those things. Oh, thanks for bringing them, by the way. No, it's that portmanteau. You couldn't do with just the Gladstone, I suppose, could you? Well, I... Oh, you see, the dinghy, um... Well, and then there's the hatchway. Oh, anyhow, let, let's try. But I'll take this, then. Aren't your crew here? Crew? <laughs> well, perhaps I should have told you. I never have any paid hands. It's quite a small boat, you know. I do hope you didn't expect luxury. Oh, come on, let's go. Isn't it rather late to go aboard? I, I think I'd rather sleep at an hotel tonight. Of course, you can do that if you, if you like. Oh, it seems worthwhile to cart all this stuff to an hotel and back to the boat tomorrow. Surely there are porters. Not at this time of night. But don't worry, the dulce is quite comfortable and you're tired. You're sure to sleep well. Anyway, I shall have to go aboard. I never sleep on shore. Heavily loaded, we stumbled over wet and treacherous railway lines and came on a stairway whose weedy steps disappeared below into the gloom of the dock. Gingerly, I descended holding as a guide a sodden painter, which ended in a very small boat, conscious that I was collecting slime on cuffs and trousers. Having once sat down with one foot in the water, I climbed wretchedly into the dinghy and awaited events. Now, uh, make fast to that ring down there. Any knot will do. Right. Uh, here comes your portmanteau. Dead amidships. All right? Got it. Does she fit? Yes, but it's a bit hassled. Now for the rest. Scratching at the greasy wall to keep the dinghy close to it, I received in succession our stores and stowed the cargo as best I could while the dinghy sank lower and lower in the water and its precarious superstructure grew higher and higher. Catch! Oh! Oh, be, be careful of that. This is blood. Yes, I know. It's, it's meat. Right. Um, she's rather deep. I think we'll manage, sir. Uh, now, you sit right aft uh, and I'll row. Oh. Right. I'm lying a little way down the fjord, you see. Hate to be too near a town. Uh, there's a carpenter handy, too. For the... This is... We'll be alongside in a jiffy. Get our gear unloaded. In a moment, he rowed us out to his boat, jumped on deck, tied the painter, and was round at my end. Hold us steady. Uh, it was a laborious right task, now, but when the stack was transferred to the deck, me. I followed it, right, now, tripping over the flabby uh, meat parcel, which was already showing ghastly oh, signs of disintegration. Uh, it's try not to stand up, old man. Oh. What was that? Hazily, there floated through my mind my last embarkation on a yacht. My faultless attire, the trim gig, the obsequious sailors. 
The accommodation ladder flashing with varnish and brass in the August sun. The orderly, snowy decks and basket chairs under the awning aft. What a contrast with this sordid midnight scramble over damp meat and littered packing cases. The bitterest touch of all was a growing sense of inferiority and ignorance, which I had never before been allowed to feel in my experience of yachts. Welcome aboard the Dulcibella. Now, I'll just show you around below first, uh, and then we'll stow things away and get to bed. Ow! Oh, mind your head. <laughs> I'll light a candle and you can look around. Righto. Hold on a second. There we are. See? Plenty of room to sit upright. Some people make such a fuss about headroom, but I never bother much about it. <laughs> oh! My sins again! Ah, oh, that's the centre plate case. <laughs> the Dulce is a flat bottom boat, drawing very little water without the centre plate, so that's why there's so little headroom. For deep water, you can lower the plate, so in one way or another, you can go practically anywhere. <laughs> now, you sit there, I'll boil some water and we'll have some grog. My eyes were used to the light now, and I took in the rest of my surroundings. Two long cushion-covered seats flanked the cabin, bounded at the aft end by cupboards, one of which was cut low to form a sideboard, with glasses hung in a rack above it. The deck overhead was very low at each side, but rose shoulder-high for a space in the middle, where a coach-house roof with a skylight gave additional cabin space. Just outside the door was a fold-up washstand. On either wall were long net racks, holding a medley of flags, charts, caps, cigar boxes, hanks of yarn and such like. Across the forehead bulkhead was a bookshelf crammed to overflowing with volumes of all sizes, mainly on yachting and naval warfare, some upside down, some coverless. Below this was a pipe rack, an aneroid, and a clock with a hearty tick. All the woodwork was painted white, and to a less jaundiced eye than mine, the interior might have had a look of enticing snugness. I'm afraid your portmanteau's too big to go down the skylight. So I've started unpacking on the deck. You, you can chuck your things down as you want them. I say, Davis. Oh, by the way, um, I doubt if there's going to be room for them all. I don't suppose you could... No, I couldn't. No, I rather thought not. <laughs> well, if you can come up on deck... I... If you go out, I shall be able to get out too. All right. I pushed past, mounted the ladder, and in the expiring moonlight groped in my belongings, sorting some into the skylight with the same feeling that nothing much mattered now. There she goes! Then I sat down on my white elephant and shivered, for the chill of autumn was in the air. How it came about, I do not know. Whether it was one of those instants of clear vision in which our separate selves are seen divided, or whether it was the impalpable air of mystery that pervaded the whole enterprise. Whatever it was, in a flash my mood changed, and I saw my silly egoism in contrast with his simple, generous nature. The crown of martyrdom disappeared, and there was left... A fashionable and dishevelled young man sitting in the dew and the dark on a ridiculous portmanteau. God's ready! I found, to my astonishment, that all trace of litter had miraculously vanished and a cosy neatness reigned. Glasses and lemons were on the table and the fragrant smell of punch had deadened all previous odours. Mmm. There's your new stove, you see. I've chucked the old one overboard. I rather like chucking things overboard. <laughs> it all looks, well, very comfortable. It is comfortable, isn't it? Yeah. Shall we have our grog in bed? The bunks are through here. Ah! Yeah. Oh! Mind your head. <laughs> all right, if I stow some stuff on this shelf. It's not a shelf, that's your bunk. No. <laughs> There's a blanket. Um, it, it seems to be a bit damp. Well, it's the dew, I expect. I did a lot of corking yesterday. Must have missed that bit. Well, I'll mop it up for you. Oh, you've hurt your hand. The bandage? Oh, that... Was... No, it's nothing. <laughs> Just a sprain. 
That reminds me, the, the new compass with joy is useful. What do you mean? Oh? What reminded you about uh, the new compass? I said, try this grog. It's jolly good. I dozed but fitfully before I reached the stage of torpor with which such slumber merges. That was finally broken by the descent through the skylight of a torrent of water. I started up, bumped my head hard against the decks, and blinked leaden-eyed upwards. Oh. Sorry, I'm scrubbing decks. Come up and bathe. Slept well. Fairly well. I stumbled up the ladder, dived overboard, and buried. Bad dreams, stiffness, frowsiness, and tormented nerves in the loveliest fjord of the lovely Baltic. A short and furious swim, and I was back again, searching for a means of ascent up the smooth black side, which, low as it was, was slippery and unsympathetic. Uh, here you are. Uh, grab hold of this rope. Got it. Now, hand over hand. Mind the paint, it's fresh. <sighs> it was a magnificent swim. <laughs> I feel a new man. Oh, you've got paint all over your knees and elbows. It's all right, I don't mind. I've only just finished painting those bits. Oh. Now, you get some togs on while I uh, finish breakfast. Eh? Bacon smells wonderful. As I dressed in white flannels and blazer, I was able to take in my surroundings hitherto hidden by darkness. The Dulcibella seemed very small. In fact, she was seven tons, some thirty feet by nine, suitable for weekends in the Solent. But that she should have come from Dover to the Baltic suggested a world of physical endeavour of which I had never dreamed. In the distant past, she had been a lifeboat, built with immense strength of two diagonal skins of teak, and the addition of deck, saloon and extra spars gave her, in the matter of looks, all the hybrid's failings. Many signs of recent refitting, a new rope or two and a diminutive mizzen mast, had given her the appearance of a respectable woman of the working classes trying to dress above her station and soon likely to give it up. Breakfast ready? Wonderful. The smell's been torturing me. My, you do look smart. <laughs> Dulce is not used to yachting rig. First thing that came to hand. Well, I expect you'll sort it all out in time. There now. Fresh bread, milk, bacon fried eggs. Have some. Mmm. Delicious. Hmm. Rare luxury. Eggs? Rare? No one has to go ashore for them. I loathe going ashore. Tea? Thank you. You must have had some exciting adventures on your cruise from England. I wish you'd tell me. Well, there's a wind now. We mustn't waste it. I'll tell you later. You finish that while I start washing up. Then we can get underway. Uh, uh, right oh. Thenceforward, events moved with bewildering rapidity. Davis was everywhere, darting swiftly to and fro between tiller and jib sheets, while the Dulcibella bowed a lingering farewell to the shore and headed for the open fjord. I became a new and unexpected obstacle in his round of activity, for my knowledge of a yacht was of that floating and inaccurate kind which is useless in practice. Isaac Carruthers, are you sure you're quite comfortable? Well, I... Uh, uh, hang on to the tiller for a jiff. But, uh, Davis, I've never... Well, here, here you go. Cushions. But well, you're still tired. But I say, can't I be of any use? Do you mind having a look at that chart? You see Flensburg? Huh? We're just here. Uh, got it. Which side of that buoy do we pass? Well, I really oh, never got... mind. I'm pretty sure it's all deep water around here. In a minute or so, we were passing the boy in question. On the wrong side, I was pretty certain for weeds and sand came suddenly into view below us with uncomfortable distinctness. There's never any sea here and the plate's not down. The best of these Schleswig waters is that a boat of this size can go almost anywhere. There's no navigation required. Aren't we aground? Ah, oh, she'll blow over. Come on, boys. There, you see. <laughs> now, we're going to have to jibe. Uh, you take the helm, will you? I'll mind the main sheet. Oh, um, I... Ready? Oh. Uh, now, helm oh. hard over. Oh. Mind your head. I had rude notions of steering, but jibing is a delicate operation, and no yachtsman will be surprised to hear that the boom saw its opportunity and swung over with a mighty crash. 
at a main sheet entangled around me and the tiller. Ah, died all standing. She brought her out of the wind. See, look at the little bird, G. Um, it's just that you're not used to her yet. She's very quick on the helm. I think she's catching the wind now. Where am I to steer? Well, never mind. I'll I'll take her now. Uh, I'm a half a duffer of sailing. Afraid there's always been a crew. Crew? Well, the whole fun of the thing is to do everything oneself. Well, I felt in the way all the more. I'm awfully sorry. It's just the other way. You, you may be all the use in the world. Uh, let's have lunch. A vision of iced drinks, tempting salads, white napery, and an attentive steward mocked me with past recollections. You'll find bottled beer under the floor in the bilge and the tongue in the locker. Aye. I opened a locker, reached down and grasped a sticky body, which turned out to be a pot of varnish. I tried the other one and a medley of damp tins of various sizes showed in the gloom exuding a mouldy odour. Faded legends spoke of soups, curries, beefs, potted meats, and other hidden delicacies. I picked out the tongue, re-imprisoned the odour, and explored for beer among the slimy ballast in the bilge. How are you getting on? The tin opener's hanging up on the bulkhead, and the plates and knives are in the cupboard. The plates and knives met me halfway cupboard being on the weather side. Its contents slid affectionately into my bosom and overflowed with a clatter and a jingle onto the floor. <laughs> that often happens. Never mind. There are no breakables. I'm coming down to help. And I think I'll come on deck. Why in the world we couldn't go ashore and save this infernal pandemonium of a picnic? Where's the yacht going to, meantime? I'm covered in varnish and mud. My, my trousers are ruined. You always chuck them overboard. <laughs> There goes the beer. Well, never mind. It'll drain into the bilge. Look, you go on deck and keep her as she's going. I'll finish getting ready, all right? Soon, I forgot petty squalors and enjoyed things. The coy tremble of the tiller and, with somewhat chastened rapture, the lunch which Davis brought up to me. Later, after we had anchored, dined on steaks with slight traces of yesterday's newspaper and washed out, Davis produced a selection of German, Dutch, and Belgian cigars. When did you leave England, exactly? Uh, August 6th. Uh, we made a good run to Ostend. Ostend in August can be fun. Ah, filthy hole. And anyway... You uh, hate going ashore. Exactly. <laughs> so then you came directly here? Yeah, up the Dutch coast, yeah. Uh, very dull. Nearly always in sight of land. Mm. Could I see your log? Oh, you'll find it very dull reading, if you could read it at all. Just short notes about winds and bearings. Well, I, I sailed up to the first of the German islands. Look at the chart there. Um, it's called Borkum. Uh, I've got it. What's all this stuff marked here? Oh, those are sands. These are the channels, you see. They're very badly charted, so it's splendid sailing ground. Wasn't this all a bit dangerous? Uh, not with the Dulcibella. She's perfect for this sort of work. And she doesn't really look that bad either. <laughs> anyway, I don't go in for looks. Didn't you ever take a pilot? Well, but the whole point of the thing... <laughs> well, I did take one once, uh, later on. And? He ran me aground. But I wonder what the weather's doing. What's it look like? Uh, well, it looks like rain. Perhaps we'd better turn in. I slept practically the whole afternoon. Tell me more about your trip. It's a longish haul to here, though. Hmm. About 70 miles direct? Direct? Then you put in somewhere. Well, I stopped once, uh, anchored for the night. The whole place is pretty deserted. Let, let's go through to bed, huh? Uh, did you never see another yacht? Another yacht? Well, yes, I, I, I did see another yacht. Uh, just the one. Um, yes, uh, just the one. Uh, good, good night, Carruthers. Uh, Good night, Davis. I'll just, uh, see my cigar out, if you don't mind. I was intrigued by this conversation, and, feeling like a thief, I took down the log of the Dulcibella. As he had said, it was pretty dull stuff, full of kedging off and boom-dodging. Until September the 9th, where it stopped abruptly, leapt over three days, and restarted on September the 11th. Quite simply, 
The relevant page had been torn out and the edges picked clean. But dissimulation was not Davis's strong point, and a child could have seen that a leaf was missing. I was on the point of calling to Davis and chaffing him with a breach of maritime law, but I checked myself and returned the book to the shelf and made my way to my bunk. Davis was sleeping like a child, but I did not find Morpheus for some hours. Ahoy! The Dalsy Bella! Ahoy! Tartles! Ah, well met, Captain! Ah. Where are you bound this time? Huh? Well, where have you come from? Have some coffee. I took some apples to Capeln, and now I sail to Kiel and then Hamburg. But, ah, you're no longer alone. Oh, I quite forgot. Uh, this is minor friend Herr Carruthers. Uh, Carruthers, this is Shiver Bartles, oh. captain of the Galliot Johannes. How do you do, Captain? Herr Carruthers. <laughs> well, I'll get some coffee. Yeah. <laughs> and the schnapps, huh? <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's good that the captain is no longer alone. He's a fine young man, but he is too brave, too reckless. It will be good for him to have a friend. Where was it you met? In an ugly place and in ugly weather. I came just in time. Really? But he has not told you. <laughs> ah, what are you two talking about? I was asking how you met. Oh, he helped me out of a bit of a mess in the North Sea. Oh, it was nothing. <laughs> but I see you've replaced the mizzenmast. Yeah. The rudder was nothing much, but it was well that it held to Flensburg. You could have died. She is strong and good, your little ship, and heaven she had need to be. <laughs> coffee. <laughs> yeah, danke. Davis plied his friend with coffee and schnapps and kept up the talk gallantly. Bartles ended with an invitation to join him at Kiel and, with suave farewells, disappeared into the fog. Oh, let's go below. Uh. What did he mean? You could have died. Oh, well, it's been fearfully on my mind. Perhaps you'll be able to help me, but it's for you to decide. It began near Norden. I. How did you guess that? I feel a bit of a cad, but I must confess I read your log. Oh, you're a bad hand at duplicity. <laughs> Go on. Well, I was anchored off Norderney. That's the easternmost of the islands. There's a town there where the Germans go sea bathing in the summer. When I saw this yacht, she was called the Medusa, about 50, 60 tons, very smart, varnished all over and flying the German ensign. The locals had told me the owner was a keen shot, so... One evening, after dinner, I sculled over in the dinghy, hailed a sailor, said who I was, and waited on deck. Then a steward came and showed me down to the saloon. It was horribly gorgeous. All mahogany and plush. <laughs> Quite awful. <laughs> exactly. A crystal and silver on the table, wine and fruit. The owner, Herr Dolman, was at his coffee. Slowly, and... slowly. What was this Dolman like? Oh, a tall, thin chap, evening dress, about fifty. Grey hair, huge eyebrows. Uh, there was something about him, I don't know. Uh, he spoke English, but, but with a heavy accent. Good evening, Herr Davis. Welcome to the Medusa. May I present my daughter, Clara? Herr Dorman. Fräulein Dorman. Just a minute. Davis, you didn't mention a daughter. The story gets much more interesting. What was she like? Oh, she seemed a very nice girl. Uh, and what brings you and your little boat to these waters? Oh, it's just a holiday. I thought there might be some duck shooting. Oh, uh, not here. You're too late in the season for ducks. Oh, please, sit down and have a glass of wine. Oh, thank you. <coughs> Cheers. Well, you are also on holiday? I had some business here. <laughs> but, uh, yes, I have been enjoying a short holiday. Oh. Tell me, now, since you have no ducks, what will you do? You would have better shooting in the Baltic, you know. Well, I suppose I'll just potter about here. <laughs> These waters are dangerous for pottering, you know. Exactly. And the charts are unreliable, so it makes it all great fun. Oh, Herr <laughs> Davis, are you not afraid of being... Oh, I'm sorry, my English is not good. Oh. Of being shipbroken. Oh, uh, <laughs> shipwrecked. <laughs> not at all, no. It's all part of the fun. Finding channels in the sands when the charts say there are none. 
These sands are dangerous for strangers. A veritable labyrinth, are they not? Indeed. But I think I'm solving it. Ah, you are making new charts? Well, hardly that. But I'm making a lot of notes. What did you say to that? Nothing much. I stayed about three days, visited a couple of times, and, and then decided to push on. And where will you push on to? Well, tomorrow I mean to go further east. Look at the other islands. I know these banks well, and I'm going east to the Elbe. Uh, perhaps I can lead the way. Act as your pilot. Well, that would be very kind. <laughs> With a fair wind and an early start, it should be an easy day's sail. Well, I look forward to it. Fraulein, head on. Them. And that was it? Uh, not by a long chalk. All went well until that evening when it started to blow up. It meant nothing for his powerful old tub, but I had to shorten sail and I fell behind. I could still see him, and he seemed to be taking a short cut across the mouth of the estuary. Now, two tides meet there, and I could hear breakers ahead. I should say the wind was now a full gale, and I knew if I went aground, the wind and the tides could break up the dulcet. By now, I was just getting glimpses of the Medusa in gaps in the rain. You asked me once if I ever took a pilot. Well, that was the only time. I saw a great wall of surf across the horizon, shutting us in, but the Medusa went at it like a horse at a fence. I was having all sorts of trouble handling the Dulcie on my own, and then the oddest thing happened. Now, I heard Don shouting at me. I could swear he shouted, follow me. Now, several times he shouted it, and then he seemed to go about, but I lost her in the school. I tried to keep my course, but I went bow first into a sandbank, broadside onto the gale. She was broaching, and with the centre plate up, it was only a matter of time before she went over. Mercifully, I took a huge wave aft, and she grinded her way over the bank. It took most of her rudder off, and I had jammed my hand on the tiller, but, well, I was in calmer water now. That was when Bartles turned up. He put out a ground anchor and lashed me alongside. A couple of days later, I got to Flensburg and rode to you. So what do you think of that? What happened to Dolman? Well, you remember? I thought I saw him go about. Yes. I believe he didn't think I'd see that. And if I'd just followed him as he shouted, I'd have gone straight into a mile-long bank and broken up for sure I'd have drowned. Dolman was trying to kill me. Are you sure? I'm pretty sure. At first, he was hoping I'd go for the Baltic and he'd see me off. Then the wind came up and he saw another opportunity. Everything was in his favour, and I'm certain he thinks I'm dead. But why? A German finds an Englishman exploring the German coast. Does he think you're a spy? I don't know, but I'm sure he is. But you see, he's not a German. He's an Englishman. What on earth makes you think that? He apologised for his English, and he had a heavy accent, but his grammar was perfect. He said things like, uh, a, a veritable labyrinth, remember? Then in the storm, when he called to me to follow him, he had no accent. I tell you, he's as English as you or I. Well, what about his daughter? I don't think English is a native language, but perhaps she was just brought up in Germany. There was talk of a stepmother in Hamburg, but I'm convinced he's in the German service. Now, that night on the Medusa, he had a friend, a German naval officer, Commander von Bruning. He had a torpedo gunboat moored nearby. You met this man? Yes. He was a really good sort, seemed a splendid officer. The Clara took me up... <laughs> Clara, now. <laughs> Fraulein Dorman took me up on deck to show me the ship, and von Bruning and Dolman had a long chat alone. Now, I'm sure she'd been told to get me out of the way. Do you see what I'm driving at? A rough idea. Go ahead. The Germans are a really great people. A huge empire stretching half across Europe. Now, they've licked the French and the Austrians, but they've got no sea power to speak of. They're building like mad. That emperor of theirs is a splendid chap. But for their colonies, they're going to need control of the sea. Now, their coastline is absurdly short, just from Denmark to Holland, with big river estuaries easily blockaded by an enemy. But these islands are something different, surrounded by shifting sands and badly charted. Perhaps there are forts and coastal defences, and Dolman didn't want you to see them. No, no, there are no forts. But suppose we were at war with Germany. These sands would be a magnificent place for small torpedo boats. They could harass all the shipping in the big estuaries if they knew the channels. And Dolman found me exploring them and tried to drown me. Well, what do you think? 
Well, I'm willing to take a good deal for granted. But it's incredible that the murder of an Englishman should be connived at by the, the agent of a friendly and civilized government. Oh, I believe Dolman did it off his own bat. Well, I believe you. At least until we find out more. Find out? Well, you, you, you mean you'll come? Hmm? Ah, nothing will stop me. Good fellow. But why did you write to me? Well, I should apologize for that, but, but I knew you spoke good German, and it's a job for sharp wits. Of course, I should have told you what you were in for, and when you came aboard, I... Well, it... <laughs> it wasn't quite what you expected, so I couldn't bring myself to tell you about my plan. What is your plan? Get back to Norderney, find Dolman, and discover what he's up to. Oh, it's a bit delicate. Hang it all, the man's an Englishman. And if he's in with the Germans, he's a traitor to us, and as Englishmen, we have a right to expose him. But I love the sea, and those chaps at the Admiralty want waking up. <laughs> quite right. <laughs> Now, the fog's lifting. Let's start for Kiel. We can meet up with Bartles there and go through the canal with him. This is splendid. Let's get the Dulcie's canvas up. <laughs> I had signed on for good or ill. Not for the first time, a sense of the ludicrous came to my assistance. Finding as an arch-conspirator a guileless and warm-hearted friend who called me clever and invited me to talk German in a little secret service in the high seas. But, close to humour, came romance, and I knew it was the rustle of her robes that I heard in the foam beneath me. I knew that it was she who handed me the cup of sparkling wine and bade me drink. It was the purest of her pure vintages, instilling the ancient inspiration which quickens thousands of better brains than mine but whose essence is always the same, the pursuit of a perilous quest. We reached the Kiel Canal at night, past the dark shapes of warships and cargo steamers, paid our dues and waited while the great gates of the largest canal in the world opened to receive the Dulcibella. Pass me those trousers. Oh, you've got them a bit paint-stained. Well, we could always chuck them overboard. I'll hang on to them for a bit, if you don't mind. <laughs> and I've got all this new stuff, much more practical. Is there a telegraph office at Kiel? Oh, yes, everything, yeah. Up at the harbour, Master. Yeah. I must telegraph my chief. Get an extension on my leave. I say, Carruthers, isn't this canal splendid? He's a fine fellow, that German emperor. Indeed. He's made Germany a thundering great nation. Do you think we'd ever go to war with them? Uh, it'd be touch and go if we did. If there were a war, we wouldn't be ready. We don't face that way. And we've already given her Heligoland. Suppose she'd call us Holland. Mm. In our talk about strategy, we felt we were Bismarcks and Rodneys, whereas, in fact, we were two young gentlemen in a seven-ton pleasure boat. But not that Davis ever doubted. It was his chance. All secure, Carruthers. Right out. There ought to be more chances for chaps like you, without the accident of a job like this. Oh, as long as I get it, what does it matter? <laughs> but, I, but I know what you mean. There must be hundreds of fellows like me, and they, they ought to make some use of us, some sort of uh, naval reserve. You want a man like this Kaiser, who doesn't wait to be kicked, but works like a Trojan for his country and sees ahead. Ah, oh, never mind, old fellow. Let's find the telegraph office. Mm. Thank you, Herr Carruthers. I will send your message and notify oh. the post office at Norderney to hold the reply till you arrive. Thank you. Uh, Herr Davis, you are captain of the Dulcibella. Yes, yes. There was an inquiry for you, a friend in a big yacht. Going to Hamburg? No, returning to the islands. It's the day before yesterday. Pity to miss him. Oh, not a him. A younger lady. What oh, God, so difficult to please. I had to search all the books. 
She wanted to be sure you had passed through to Flensburg. I found your passage in the books, and she went away happy. Perhaps we'll meet her at Nordner. Thank you. Field look. Good eyes. So we set off for Nordenai, busying ourselves with chart, marking passages, and directly encountering no other boats on the way. But being aware of one local boat following our course with remarkable accuracy. I hardened to the life, grew salt, tough, and tolerably alert. And more than once I gave thanks to the stout skins of the Dulcibella, knit together by honest labour. Outside Bernaseal Harbour, we beached for the night so that Davis, untypically, could go ashore to fetch more supplies. I was dozing lightly when I heard a sound as of a man stepping in a puddle. Davis? Is that you, Davis? I knew in a flash it was not, for I could hear the footsteps going round the hull, and then the scrape of a match as he read the name on the stern. A pause then a vibration as hands grasped the gunwale and my visitor was on deck. Then the beam from the riding light was obscured as he came to the companionway and I lunged at him. I grasped something damp and greasy. There was tugging and heavy breathing and I was left holding a big sea boot whose owner I heard jump onto the sand and run off. Well, I think you did jolly well. Now, I asked some questions in the village. Apparently, the boat that we felt was following us is called the Cormoran. She's involved in trying to raise some treasure from a wreck at Eust. That's the next island after Norderney. What could our visitor have wanted? Well, our charts with all our corrections in the log would have given the game away. And my naval books. But they're innocuous enough. Falcon in the Baltic. Sailing tours. A guide to the Solent. Let me see that guide to the Solent. Something about... By Lieutenant Dodgson, R.N. My God! Look at the frontispiece. Yes? Wait, it's Dolman. The shape of the head, the, the, those eyebrows, I'd know them anywhere. Published 16 years ago. He looks about 30-odd in this. You say he's now in his 50s? Right, yeah. So 16 years ago, he's still an officer in His Majesty's Navy, and at some time between then and now, I suppose he came to grief. Disgrace. Flight exile. How old is Clara? Uh, 19, 20. So she may have talked German since a child. Is this book well known? I've never seen another copy. I picked it up on a second-hand stall for threepence or something. Did he ever come on board the Dulcibella? Only once. Hmm, if he spotted this, once would have been enough. It explains a lot. If he thought the jig was up, he must be into something pretty deep to try murder. That is well our latest visitor didn't find this. But we can't be any threat. We don't even know what we're looking for. Well, the, these islands guard the coast, and, and the channels between them and the coast were largely unmarked. But there's nothing on the coast, just tiny villages and canal sluices. <sighs> it's a riddle, I admit. Let's get to sleep. We'll go into Bernaseal tomorrow. Uh. Guten Morgen, gentlemen. My name is Grimm. Uh, I'm the diving overseer on board the Cormoran. Good morning, Hagrim. Good morning. I have a message from Herrn von Brüning. Yes? He asks that you join him at the inn at 12 o'clock for some refreshment. Yeah. Please tell von Brüning that he is very kind and that we will be delighted. Very good. <laughs> oh, what do you make of that? Never mind. What do you make of Hagrim? Quick, look at his feet. What do you mean? He's wearing shoes. A diving supervisor without sea boots? Perhaps because he's only got one left. Exactly. So it was the cormoran who was following us. And now von Brüning wants to see us. What do we tell him? I say, I'd rather funk this interview. It's not my line. Just be yourself. If you have to, tell him just the one lie about how Dolman tried to trick you. Commander von Brüning gave us a hearty welcome. And I am bound to say I liked him at once, as Davis had done. But I feared him, too, for he had honest eyes, but abominably clever ones. Herr Dolman is still away, I think. 
Were you thinking of looking him up again? Yes, yes. Uh, y yes, I'm sure he's away. But uh, his yacht is back, I believe, and Fräulein Dolman. Oh, we can call on Fräulein Dolman, at least. <laughs> Herr Dolman will be back soon, I expect. But you have seen him later than I have, have you not? Didn't you sail to the Elbe together? Oh, well, only part of the way. He, um, he outsailed me. Gave you the slip, did he? Well, he had the better of the wind. <laughs> Upon my word, Herr Carruthers, your friend amuses me. It's impossible to get him to spin a yarn. <laughs> mm. <sighs> I'm surprised you didn't sail for England last night. There was a fair wind. But no pilot to follow? Certainly none with a charming daughter, no. Not quite. <laughs> so, what are your plans? Uh, nothing specific, really. Take care of your Dulce Bella now. The folk around here are as honest as any, but they come from a long line of pirates and wreckers. We heard there was the wreck of a treasure ship near here. Uh, quite right. Uh, the Corin. She went down of Mehmet in 1811 with a million and a half in gold bars. Your Lloyds of London are still disputing the title, but there is a small local company trying to raise her. Herr Dolman is a partner, and uh, I have a few shares myself. We use an old depot on Mehmet as a base. Found in a gold jet? It's very difficult. The sands shift, you know. I hope we haven't been asking indiscreet questions. Oh, not at all. Uh, this is your first visit to Germany, Herr Carruthers? Uh, no, I studied here. Uh, for your profession, no doubt. Yes, I am. Uh, I, I am with the Foreign Office. As all. The government service. When must you return? Pretty soon. But I'm expecting a telegram giving me an extension. However, the season is late for yachts, and all your ducks have flown. Uh, oh, you must excuse me, I have some business in Eason's, a uh, fellow caught poaching. No. I'm really just a policeman, you see. Uh, will you travel on to another night today? Uh, without a decent wind, we could be stuck in the harbour for days. I'll give you a tow out. A tow? Oh, no, I, I don't want to. <laughs> he objects to towage on principle, but we'll accept your kind offer. Be alongside at six. Um, excuse me, Herr Davies. Uh, Herr Carruthers, a word, if I may. Oh, certainly. Right, eh? About your friend. He's a splendid chap. But perhaps too honest and straightforward. You have known him long? Since we were at university together. Oh, so he is your sailing companion. <laughs> Not exactly. But he invited me to come out here for some sport. And since I was at a bit of a loose end, I joined him. The sport has been good? Oh, I assure you, Commander, the sport has been excellent. These are fascinating waters. Oh, indeed, but dangerous for those who do not know them, no? Oh, certainly. But then, a bit of danger makes a holiday much more an adventure. I'm sure you agree. <laughs> Indeed, we are very similar, I think, Herr Carruthers. Yes. Uh, but Herr Davis has perhaps found another adventure. One of the hearts. Oh, Fräulein Dolman. Precisely. And it is about this that I wish to speak to you alone. It was very rude of me, but I felt it necessary. You see, there might be a difficulty with her father. Difficulty? Uh, the salvage affair is not his only interest. He has many interests in Hamburg and elsewhere. And we, uh, the authorities, you understand, are not entirely happy with some of them. He is, um, how do you put it in English, sailing dangerously. Uh, sailing close to the wind. And two young English gentlemen becoming involved with his affairs might be in some difficulties. Of course, I'm sure it's nothing. Just silly policemen being too suspicious. Herr Dolman is well respected in these parts, but uh, you would do well not to renew your acquaintance with him. I've never met him, you know. Oh, but Herr Davis and Fräulein Dolman, even uh, though I'm certain she is in no way involved, you could perhaps discourage him. 
It would not be wise to seek out the Medusa. Herr Davis will make up his own mind, but I will tell him what you said, and I thank you for your advice. It is always useful to have as much information as possible, don't you think? <laughs> I'm sure you are very good at gaining information, <laughs> just like your foreign office. <laughs> Auf Wiedersehen, Herr Carabas. Auf Wiedersehen, Commander. What was all that about? Just warning us off the dolmens. Von Bruning spun me a yarn about his business affairs not being all they might be, and to avoid getting mixed up in them. The fellow's a traitor and a murderer. We must find out what he's up to and scotch him. But since they don't want us to have contact with him, we can only think he's their weak link. Oh, and Von Bruning seemed to think his daughter's not involved. Oh, I was sure about that. Makes me feel a bit caddish about the whole affair. Let's get back to see. Anyway, the problem is, they're sure we're onto them. Or at least close to whatever they're up to. And we have not the slightest idea what that might be. Just a moment. Look at that dike. Well, yeah. It goes all the way along the coast. You don't think this coast could be invaded by whale, do you? Oh, I thought of that. No. No transport could get behind the islands. And the dike's only broken by the sluice gates. No, whatever it is, it's not defensive. I'm sure of it. It's the water that's the answer. I'm sure of that. Davis swallowed his objections to towage, and von Bruning was as good as his word, and took us to a safe anchorage where he bade us farewell, with a promise to do anything he could to help us if we so wanted. When I awakened, not seeing Davis, and as yet not having mastered the murky mysteries of the Ripping Girl Number Three, I went on deck. Davis was staring fixedly through the binoculars, and to my astonishment, trembling violently. Davis, are you all right? That boat, there, the, coming towards us. Yes. Well, it's the Medusa's dinghy, and that's her, Clara. She's coming to meet us. Oh, splendid. Carabas, when she comes aboard, please remember that she's outside this business. It's your affair this time. Run it as you like. All right. As Davis helped her aboard and introduced her as Fräulein Dolpen, I saw that every syllable of her name was a lie. Two honest English eyes were looking up into mine, and an honest English hand. Is this insular nonsense? Perhaps so, but I will stick to it. A brown, firm hand. No, not so very small, my sentimental listener, was clasping mine. You've seen the Dulcie before, haven't you? I haven't been aboard before. It's very small. But she looks strong. How did you manage alone that day? Oh, it was quite safe. Yes, father said it would be safe. You're sailing to Norderney? Of course. Yeah, I'd like to see your father again. My father? Yes, I'm sure he'd be glad to see you. He returns tomorrow by train, and then he takes the ferry to Memat. Memat? It's another island. He has business there. Ah, yes, the gold. Is the Medusa in harbour at Norderney? Ah, yes, but we're not living on her. We're in town at our villa in the Schwanale. May I see below? Oh, delighted. I, I, I'm afraid it's a bit of a mess. It's um, very snug. So many books. <laughs> Carruthers and I'll uh, make some cocoa. Well, isn't she the most splendid girl? Absolutely. And I'm certain she's not German either. Just look at her. I'm more than certain she knows nothing of this. I wonder what she knows of her father's past. She can't suspect us of anything. Otherwise, why visit us? Mein Herrn, please, no, Coco. It's it's late, and I must go now. Oh, but... Uh, no, um... I'm sorry. Uh, Herr Carruthers can help me to begin with. All right. Well, of course. Uh, uh... Right. Herr Carruthers, I made a mistake just now. It's no use your calling on us tomorrow. Uh, why not? I thought your father was coming back. Oh, he will be very busy, and the weather is fine. It would be a pity to lose the chance of a smooth voyage to England. It was wrong of me to come aboard. Uh, please say goodbye to Herr Davis for me. Uh, certainly. And had nothing better be said about this meeting? It must never be known. Goodbye, Herr Carruthers. Uh, bye. Carruthers? She's rowing off. What on earth happened? She was startled by something. I swear she was trembling when she got back in her dinghy. Let's look below. All right. Thank you. 
She must have realised that we know. But will she tell our father? I don't think she can, without admitting that she's met us. He probably still thinks you're dead. Mm. Let's get to Nordenai and see if he arrives. Mm. There's the ferry for Mehmet, and the passengers are boarding now. So where's Dorman? Um, there he is, with the cigar. Who's that new fellow with him? No idea. But there's Grimm. Ah, so all three are bound for their depot on Mammoth. A meeting of some sort. Looks like it. Let's go and get our letters. Right. Two letters. One saying go ahead and take an extension of leave. The second one is from my boss saying roughly come back on time or don't come back at all. Oh, <laughs> don't worry. I shall claim the second letter never arrived. <laughs> But I sent a telegram to a friend in the Admiralty. He can check Dodgson, or rather Dolman, for us. Yeah. Well, hear that? We'd better get back to the Dulcibella while we can still find her. Yeah. If this fog holds, I wouldn't half mind having a look at their depot. Can we get there? Well, the depot's marked on the chart. It'd be about six miles sailing and then another two in the dinghy. But you're right. With this fog, they'd never spot us. And if we muffled the rocks, we could get the dinghy jolly close without their even hearing us. If we can find our way across the sands in the fog, that's pretty near impossible. Come on, it's going to be great. Right. <laughs> Davis was in his element, taking bearings in the fog where we could, and then anchoring by a line of marker posts. Together we rode with Davis like a link boy in a London fog, bearing the prismatic compass, until, exhausted, we fetched up on a sandbank. Where are we? A quarter of a mile across the sandbank from the depot. Well done, Davis. I'll go on from here alone. But why not both of us? If anything happens to me, you'll still be able to tell what little we know. Perhaps the Admiralty will make some sense of it. What's that? That's the Mammoth Foghorn. Now, keep aiming for it on the way out, and keep it behind you on the way back. You got your watch? Uh, matches? Knife? Uh, no knife. Uh, take mine. Yes. And the compass. Now, never budge from the shore without using it. And lay it on the ground for accuracy. You'll pass a big beacon east of here on the shore. I'll meet you there in one hour and a half. What if I'm late? Well, you can't be. The tide's rising, and we must be back in harbour before the fog clears and we're missed. Now, if you can't find me, blow the whistle and I'll answer. What was that now? Some ship's bell. Uh, six bells in the afternoon watch. Now go, and good luck. I advance in stages of ten yards or so, always checking that the sea was on my left, until I fell headlong over a half-hidden iron bar. My visibility was no more than a yard or so, and it took me time to see that it was the signal beacon Davis had mentioned. I laid the compass down and found the bearing. Northwest of the depot, so it would be southeast coming back. I tried to memorize what I met on the way. An anchor, then a heap of rusty cable, then an upturned boat with a filthy old pipe lying on it. Now I could smell tobacco and hear coughing. Then I met the wall of the depot and heard footsteps, thankfully going away from me. Round the corner, someone opened a window, throwing out a cigar. I crawled along the wall and peered in at the window. They were all there. Von Bruning, Grimm, the third man from the harbour, and Dolman, with his chair propped up at the window. I ducked down as Grimm looked out the window and pulled the curtain. Go ahead, Dolman. The third man asked Dolman for his report, and Dolman uttered the single word, Chatham, before the window was shut. I could hear no more, but just managed to force the blade of Davis's knife into a crack. Good man, Davis. Aber werden Sie am 25. Wenn die Flut günstig ist, die Schlepper sind bereit. 
I made out very little more, except a string of statistics and letters. And then it was high time for me to go. Southeast, I managed to remember. Running over the dunes, past the boat and the anchor, and then I was at the shoreline. But no beacon. I had got myself lost in less than 20 yards. Going left would only have taken me back towards the hut. I was conscious that this was wasting time, so in desperation I blew my whistle. Davis answered, but from my right. And in four minutes I was back in the dinghy and we were pulling with all our might. There was no time for chat with Davis until we retraced our route to the Dulcibella. He was engrossed with the compass in one hand and the tiller in the other. But around the tight set of lips, I fancied I could discern the joy of satisfaction in the impossible achieved. When we got in sight of the Dulcibella, our hearts leapt into our mouths as we saw von Brüning's launch alongside and two men standing on the afterdeck. Good God! How did they get here? That launch of von Brüning's got three times our speed. Are you sure that no one saw you on Memmott? Pretty sure. Anyway, the only thing for it is to brazen it out. I only wish we had some ducks to bear out our story. I only wish I was any good at this sort of thing. Ahoy there! To the board! Is that you, Herr Davies? We wondered where you two had got to. Just rowing about since the fog cleared. <laughs> you had no riding light. We came aboard to set it. Oh, we took it with us. <clears throat> to see, to shoot by. Yeah. And you muffled your oars so as to creep up on the ducks? <laughs> <laughs> I would like you to be my guests for dinner this evening. We shall be delighted. You are in the Chonolet, are you not? In an hour, then. You must him to stay while we drift. Uh, uh, Herr Dolman, hmm? why not keep us company while we change? With pleasure. <laughs> um, uh, come along, Dolman. You'll just be in the way. Uh, we'll see you both later. <laughs> what was that about? I'd call it a draw. They haven't got any proof of what we're up to. On the other hand, they certainly don't altogether believe our story. I'm not surprised. We must seem a bit shifty. And von Brüning's as sharp as a tack. But they don't altogether trust Dolman on his own either. I thought as much. Ah, but if he's at the centre of it all, why on earth not? Because, as we now know, he's a turncoat. And he could as easily turn back. A spy in the enemy camp may be necessary, but it's a dirty business. And no one will ever quite trust them. That's why von Brüning has been so keen to keep us away from Dolan. Mm. Now, I wonder what they did here. Let's have a look below. Right. Place. Uh, the logbook's been moved. First thing they'd look for. And then they leave it lying around so that we know they're checking our every move. And Dorman's books under these cushions, that's odd. There's no earthly reason why they should hide it. But Dorman might want to keep his past obscure. This means he knows we've found his real name. <laughs> it's going to be a fascinating dinner party. What did you find at the depot? I'll tell you while we change. I think my dress togs might still be wearable. I might have guessed you'd bring white tie. <laughs> Firstly, the new chap's called Burma. He seems to be some sort of government boss. Yeah. Anyway, they all deferred to him. Now, secondly, what are there seven of around here? I overheard them using letters from G to A. Uh, islands. Well, the German islands. There are seven of those. Oh, it could be. There's someone important coming on the night train on the 25th. Hmm? Someone who has more right than anyone else in Germany. You mean the man at the centre of it all, who's planned it? More than that. It had been explained to him, so he's above all that. When he was mentioned, they all went very quiet. I'm not sure, of course, but it sounded as if he was the very top man. The Kaiser himself? It sounded very like that. Anyway, whoever it is, is coming on the night train on the 25th to Eason's. But that's a guess. Now try this. There was a lot of talk about pilots and tugs. Then they said, one load, half full, and the tide serves. Well, the high tide on the 25th to be about 11 at night. That fits with the night train. Good man. It's like trying to do a jigsaw when you don't know what the final picture is supposed to be. <laughs> but we're getting close. Snag is, they're onto us now. Mm. 
And they think we know more than we really do. All we know for sure is that Dolman is a traitor and that they're frightened of what else we may know. Is this tight, straight? Yes, yes. But how do we find out more? We've got them off balance. And we've got to play on that. We must get away on our own again. I vote we split up for a bit and throw them off the scent. Oh, Carruthers! I'll say I've been recalled. It's nearly the truth. If they're as worried as I think, then they'll have two trails to follow. No need to make it easy for them. We must meet that night train. You go off for a potter, and we meet again on the 25th at Aeson's. Damn, I've only brought black cufflings. Never mind your cufflings. What about the Dulcie? Eason's is inland, for pity's sake. Oh, come on, Davis. We've found the covert. All we have to do now is flush out the fox. Smother your objections and anchor the Dulcie nearby. <sighs> Burma seal? We'll do splendidly. Now, let's go and enjoy the hospitality of a traitor. So he sailed free, and I thought I would be left on the sands holding the damn catch. <laughs> <laughs> My dear fellow, I would never have left you. <laughs> but now I hear you are to leave us. I am afraid so. I collected my letters this morning, and amongst them was a summons to return. Oh, our acquaintance has been very short, meine Herren. Fräulein Dolman, when the foreign office calls, I must obey. Mm. You leave tomorrow. There's a ferry to the railway station at 8.15, I believe, Herr Burma. No, that is good. We should be companions. I'm going to Bremen. So we will be together as far as Lair. It was a short stay here, then, Herr Burma. As usual. I visit the work at Mehmet once a month. Mehmet. <clears throat> Do tell us more about Mehmet. We're dying to know, aren't we, Davis? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Commander von Bruning was very discreet. And now you'll pump me. Oh, it's all von Bruning's fault. <laughs> My fault. <laughs> of course. You told us you did not know when her doorman was returning. But today you all came aboard, having been at Mehmet. So you must have known of her doorman's movements to arrange the meeting. <laughs> But why should I want to deceive you? That's just what I want to know. Come now. Confess it. You found the gold. I cannot assist you, I'm afraid. I'm merely a shareholder. Herr Burma? As an engineer, I cannot speak in front of the chairman of the company. And I must protect the interests of the shareholders. Mm. They're all against us, Davis. Oh, chuck it, Carruthers. <laughs> Herr Carruthers, I can assure you there's nothing there but mud. Otherwise, we might have had a picnic party there. <laughs> Impromptu parties are always the pleasantest, and this one is exceptionally pleasant. As my hostess, I thank you. <laughs> but I bet I know its origin. Didn't you discuss us at Mehmet? And didn't you come aboard the Dulcibella to look us over? <laughs> I warned you, Burma. <laughs> Indeed, we owe you both apologies. Well, don't mention it, please. What did you take us for? <laughs> Perhaps we take you for it still. Then when I get back to London, I shall go straight to Lloyd's. I haven't forgotten about that flaw in the title. Gentlemen, we must come to terms with this formidable young man. <laughs> <laughs> now, what are your demands? Take me to Mehmet. But you said you were leaving for England tomorrow. Oh, if I change my mind, it is my affair. Now, will you take me to Mehmet? He is invincible. He concede. Tomorrow we'll show you everything. If you don't object to a diver's dress... Victory. We've won our point, Davis. <laughs> and now, gentlemen, I don't mind saying that as far as I'm concerned, the joke's at an end. In spite of your kind offer, I must start for England. Oh. <laughs> well played, Herr Carruthers. As Fräulein Clara has said, you would have seen only mud. But I would like to go to Mehmet. I thought you were sailing for England. Oh, perhaps Fräulein Dorman would like to accompany me for a picnic party? Oh, thank you, but I think I will not be sailing again. The season's getting too cold. And it is also getting late. Fräulein Dorman, I must thank you for a most delightful dinner. <laughs> and you, gentlemen, for an excellent game of wits. Oh. <coughs> Come, Davis. They will wish to talk us over. <laughs> 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 Through a haze of wine, we made our farewells and were in the streets again under a silver, breathless night, dizzily footing the greasy ladder and into the cabin, where I collapsed on the bench just as I was and slept such a deep and stringent sleep that von Bruning's men might have handcuffed and trussed and carried me away without incommoding me in the least. Davis, wake up. Come on, Davis, get in here. What's, what's, what's the matter? 
What time is it? Never mind the time. It's about Dolman, or Dodgson, we should call him. Mm-hmm. I've had an answer to my telegram. Listen to this. Dodgson resigned commission to avoid scandal, we confidential papers stop. Wife dead three years previous, fled with only daughter stop. Believed working with Nordwestdeutsche shipping line stop. Howard Duck stop, Hawkins. There you are. So I was right. But he's our man, all right. Well, what do we do now? Carry on with our plan. We still don't really know what they're up to. But I'll stake my life it's treacherous. And Clara? I'm sure she's not involved. Look, I've got to go and meet Boma now. But I'll be back to meet you in Aysons at 10.30 on the 25th. Lie low till then. Uh, good luck. Good luck, Davis, old chap. See you at the station. I left Davis on the quay, bareheaded and wearing his old Norfolk jacket and stained grey flannels, as at our first meeting at Flensburg Station. There was no bandaged hand this time, but he looked pinched and depressed. With the bulk of Burma looking over my shoulder, I took a ticket to Amsterdam and sat in stony silence with him until he left the train at Lair. Don't forget to go to Lloyd's, he grated into my ear. I expect it was a wan smile that I returned, for I was at a very low ebb, and my fortress looked sarcastically impregnable. But the sapper was free, and I held on to this thought as I sent a cable to my chief. Very sorry, could not call Nordenai. Hope extension all right. Please write Hotel de Louvre, Paris. I hoped I had thrown Burma off the scent. Now I was indulging in the same deceit with His Majesty's Foreign Office. Staying at sordid lodgings, I passed the time until the 25th, poring over maps of the region and trying to put the pieces of the puzzle into a coherent picture. Seven. Seven islands. Tugs and tides. They're moving something. To the islands. From the islands. Check the railways. Railways come into it. Perhaps Davis has had some thought. Then, at last, it was the 25th, and I was on the platform at Aysons and looking for him in the dark drizzle of rain. Brothers, over here! Davis, how are you? Well enough. I've been ashore all day, though. <laughs> Let's get farther down the platform. We don't want to be spotted if anyone turns up. Right. Here, behind these mailbags. Right. Now, have you found anything? Well, I think I've got some of the answers. How about you? A theory, no more. This railway here is a loop line. The main line runs from Emden to Wilhelmshaven, mm. and then on into the heart of Germany. But this loop runs parallel to the sea for 40 miles behind the islands. That's why they're interested in it. Well, listen to this. Now, you were right. The seven letters from A to G, now, I thought they must be the islands. And so did I. Yeah, but they might not be. I now think they are the channels between the islands. Ah. That's why they wanted to know about the tides. And the other word you heard? Ah, tugs? Exactly. Tugs mean only one thing, to me at least. Barges! Spot on. Now, at the end of each of these channels, there's a village, and I've been nosing around them. They've all got boatyards, and they're building barges. Bigger than our coal barges, about half as big again, and all new. So with this railway, they could move stuff up here, load it into the barge. If the tide serves, remember? Steady. Here comes Grimm and von Brunning. Sehen Sie, punktlich wie immer. Oh, what's that me, Ra? On their own. I told you, they don't trust Donman. Just in time to meet this train. I think we've got this bit right, at least. Don't you see, tonight there's a high tide. They're going to try it out. With a half load. There's even a tug with steam up in Bernasil Harbour. Careful. Burma's getting off. But who's he with? Uh, I don't know. But von Brüning saluted him. Could he be the Kaiser? Too dark to see. We don't risk getting any closer. They're going into the buffet. Nice warming glass of schnapps, no doubt. Right. I wager they're bound for Bernasil. We can beat them there across the fields. Let's find this tug of yours. My chain of thought was, I fancy, this. 
The tug is to carry my conspirators, and I cannot shadow a tug from the shore, yet I still intend to shadow my party. So, we must go aboard. Mercifully, there were no crew in sight, and there was a clinking of glasses from the forecastle. No watch, Cat. Pretty sloppy, I should say. They've got steam up. I suppose they're keeping out of the rain until the visitors arrive. Now's our chance. But where can we hide? No sign of Treasure Island's apple barrel. The portside lifeboat. Across the deck? But what if? Never mind what if. Come on, follow me. Carruthers! Boots off! And walk on the side of the gangway. It won't crack. Good man. Out of the wheelhouse. There's no watch. Can we have a look in the forecastle? No. If we can see them, then they can see us. Come on, get on the cover. I suppose you're right. Now get the tarpaulin over our heads. Can you see? Perfectly. The crew are coming up on deck. Now, here comes our shore party. Leinen los. Wir legen jetzt ab. Trip round the bay? Not quite. Feel that jerk? Yes. We've taken up a tow. It's a barge. It's one of my barges. Oh, quiet, Davis. Boomer and his lot have climbed onto it. I'm going to... Come, Rathers, what are you doing? You'll, you'll be spotted. The crew are all looking out to sea, and the rest are peering into the barge. I'll be all right, you'll see. Oh, my God, you got... I made my way aft to the barge hawser and saw the Germans all peering into the barge's cavernous hold. As to my surprise, the tug veered to port. Not for the open sea, as I had thought, but on a line for Mehmet. The barge heeled over, and then I caught a glimpse of her cargo. I had seen enough, and was aware that at any moment someone might turn round and catch sight of me. I slipped back into our hiding place. Well, I saw the cargo. It's coal. The thing's half full of coal. And we've changed course for Mehmet. And Mehmet's the course I'd set for England. I've got it. It's a rehearsal, so they're using coal. In the real thing, it'll be soldiers. Or guns, equipment, whatever they like. And that's it. We've solved the riddle. Each tug with eight barges. Von Bruni said something like that. The barge would hold about 200 men. That's 1,600 men for each tug. An entire battalion. Then... Four tugs to each channel, 24 regiments. This will be bigger than the Spanish Armada. That's why the Kaiser's here. They're plotting the invasion of England. We've got to get out of here. Right. Start freeing those davits. We've still got surprise on our side. Surprise? For what? Carruthers, what are you going to do? You're going to chuck those spare life belts overboard. What on earth for? You like chucking things overboard. Oh. And when the helmsman looks round to see what's splashed, you see those oarskins on the deck? Yes. I'll grab one of those. Then I look just like anyone else, and I can take the wheel. Carruthers! It's our only chance. Now do it! Carruthers, you've got no boots on! I managed to don an oilskin from a heap on the hatch cover, and coming beside the helmsman, I asked him for the wheel in what I hoped was my best German admiralty voice. He muttered something about a smoke, and I had control of the tug. Thanks to Davis's tuition, I knew we were running parallel to the great bank of Langeroog, and I edged her closer until I could feel a tremble of mud below her keel. Then I threw the wheel hard over, and she dug in bow first. The wheel went rigid in my hands, and we were stuck fast on the sandbank. In the scene of panic that followed, it is safe to say that I was the only soul on board who acted with methodical tranquillity as I threw off my robe of office and made for the boat. Cut the fault. She's well over to starboard. There can only be a few feet to the sea. Here goes. Now, pull for the Dulcibella. What was that? The tow line on the barge is parted. <laughs> what a mess. <laughs> it's lovely. <laughs> Wonderful. How long to Nordenai? 
Well, with this wind, the Darcy will get us there in a couple of hours. But why Nord and I? Well, that's where Dolman is. We must face him with all this. He's the last piece in the riddle. Now we know what the Germans were doing. I want to know what he's been up to. Didn't he say something about Chatham out of the hub? By Jove, he did. That's it. He's been checking our defences, the fiend. Chatham, the Medway, the Solent. His book was on the Solent. Our only admiralty bases are in the Solent. And we have no North Sea squadrons. We've never thought of an attack coming from the north. They could land at the wash, as much the nearest, undefended. Move south from there. By the time the alarm was up, they'd have their stores ashore and be miles inland. My God, it's thorough. It's German, and it would work. We must collect Dolman and get him back to England. Herr Dolman, eine dringende Nachricht von Fregatten Kapitän von Brunnen. Ja, ja, ich komm schon, ich komm schon. Was gibt's denn? Good morning, Lieutenant Dodgson. I must apologize for calling so early. Well, who is Lieutenant Dodgson? <laughs> we probably understand each other, so to explain is to lose time. We sail for England in half an hour, and we would like the pleasure of your company. We promise you immunity on certain conditions which can wait. We have only two berths, so we can only accommodate Miss Clara besides yourself. You confounded, meddlesome young idiots. And I thought I had done with you. Promise me immunity? By God, I'll give you five minutes to be off to England and be damned to you, or else you'll be locked up for spies. What the devil do you take me for? A traitor in the German service. Me? A traitor? You pig-headed young fools. I'm in the British service. You're wrecking the work of years and on the very threshold of success. Very well, we'll clear out. Carruthers. But just a moment, Davis. We'll clear out as we appear to have acted in error. But it's only right to tell you that we know everything. What? What do you know? I was taking notes at Mehmet the other night, and we were both at the experiment at Benesil tonight. Don't think about raising an alarm. We've taken precautions and the secrets in safe hands. Von Bruning and his chaps are on our track. If they find you with us, <laughs> you know they don't altogether trust you, and... What did you say about immunity? Uh, for Clara, at least. She knows nothing of this. We're friends. We want to help you both. Uh, come with us now. Wake Clara and tell her, or it'll be too late. Tell her? Oh, no, no. I, I, I can't tell her. Uh, you tell her, lad. Where's her room? Above this one. Well, go out, Clara. There's, um... Not I. I should frighten her into a fit. Well, I don't like to. Oh, nonsense, man. We'll both go. Don't be frightened. It's I, Carruthers, and, and Davis. Please come to your father. We're going to take you both to England and the Dulcibella. I don't understand. Clara, will you not trust us? Must we, father? I'm very much afraid we must, my dear. It is strange to think we are going to England. But you were born there. Yeah, but I remember nothing of it. Where must we go? Well, your father must go to London. But I don't imagine they'll bother you much. I, um... Well, I have an aunt in Dorset you could stay with. Mm. But until it's all settled, I mean... Dorset? Is that near the sea? Some cocoa, Dobson? Uh, you are very hospitable, Carruthers, uh, but no thank you. Uh, perhaps the others. I'll ask them. Carruthers? Yes? May I ask, where are we headed? The Dutch coast, then by train and steamer to England. And what do you intend to do with me when we get to England? Hand you over to the authorities in London. London. Yes. Now, if you'll excuse me. Yes, of course. Uh, no need to lash the tiller. Since we're headed for Holland, there is a short cut through the sands, if you have no objections. By all means. Oh, how is my father? Steering us through the sands. He says he knows a shortcut. Yeah, he knows these waters well, like Mr. Davis here. <laughs> will it be bad for him in England? No, it will not be easy. Yeah. 
But you need not be involved. I'm just going to brew some cocoa. Any for you too? Oh, 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 He's taking us across the wind. What happened, brothers? Dorman. He's gone. I, I left him with a tiller and now he's nowhere to be seen. We must put about and search? No, no. No use, I'm afraid. In this sea at night... And he was wearing sea boots and a greatcoat. So that was his shortcut. Go to Clara. Stay on deck, old man, would you? Understood. I'd rather do this alone. My dear chap, you're looking very, um, festive. <laughs> Been to a wedding down in Dorset. Ah, you remember Davis. Oh, the chap you went duck shooting with? The very one. He's married a girl we met over there. Jolly decent sort of girl, too. I say, Carruthers, um, about that trip of yours, uh, just after you got back, there was an awful to-do about sea defences. They said some chap in the foreign office had discovered something on the German coast. It wasn't you by any chance, was it? Well, Davis discovered his girl there, and I didn't discover any ducks. So I don't really know. Just the uh, two of you, were there? No, there was another. A bit of a heroine, really. Ah, Davis's girl? Oh, no. We shared this one. Shared her? Really, Carruthers, uh, I know you're all a bit wild in the F.O., but um, shared? I told you, she was a heroine. I'll buy you a brandy and soda and we'll drink our health. What was her name? Dulcie. She was called Dulcibella. Stuart? Stuart? <laughs> 